Fair Play, a novel by Pete Fisher. Chapter 16. Bub Rock and Parcels. The bust had hit Martin like a wrecking ball. He didn't go anywhere for days. He stayed at home and licked his emotional wounds. He didn't tell anyone about it. He asked his flatmates to keep it to themselves. It was bound to make the rounds sooner or later. The only good thing that happened that week was that Daniel's cheque arrived at last. £700. The biggest lump sum Martin had ever received. His account was about 400 in the red, so that left 300 It was coming up to Christmas. Martin had promised himself a new amp. He'd set his heart on a fender. The local shop had a Fender Pro Reverb, reasonably priced at 250 quid, brand new. Martin tried it out in the shop. It sounded brilliant. You could slice cheese with that treble. He traded in his old Vox for 50 quid, what he'd paid for it. When Martin got the new amp home, he admired the silver brush steel control panel, the silver logo and the matching silver speaker cloth front. He plugged in his Gibson and played some blues. Dave was a mate of Mick's, who Martin scored hash and sometimes speed from. Both of them had been to the same college as Martin. Mick was on the dole and dealing. Dave was a schoolteacher. Dave also happened to play bass. He had a band who were beginning to do gigs around the North London pubs. They were round at Mix listening to the meters one afternoon when Dave suggested Martin come round sometime for a jam. Dave lived about ten minutes from Martin's place. The area was a lot more East End than the relatively posh suburb where Martin lived. Drab, grubby streets with run-down terraced houses and shabby semi-detached. Hardly a tree in sight. Martin knew it well from his dustbin days. He rang the doorbell. Dave's girlfriend, Kath, answered the door. She was a skinny, cockney lass with a blonde bob. She had a rather high-pitched voice, but she had a heart of gold. She showed Martin into the front room. Dave was rolling a joint on the coffee table. Martin put down his acoustic guitar. Hey up, Martin. How you doing, mate? Dave mixed his native Lincolnshire with East End. Got a new amp, Pro Reverb. Sounds brilliant with the Les Paul. Cool. Heard you had a bit of bad luck, mate. Sorry to hear it. I was trying to keep it quiet. Just as well everyone's on their toes. Fucking drag, though. What do you reckon you'll get? No idea, mate. Hoping it'll be a suspended. Dave passed Martin the joint. Kath brought him a can of lager from the fridge. Martin changed the subject. So how's the band going? Oh, we found a name. Blackbird Pie. Like in the nursery rhyme. Whatever, I reckon it's catchy. Dave got his acoustic guitar out and tuned up. Martin did the same. They strummed through a few familiar songs, taken in turns to sing. Then they began to improvise, alternating rhythm and lead. It seemed to work really well. Dave was good on guitar and had a great voice. Martin picked up songs he'd never played really quickly. They stopped for another beer. Dave was impressed. Listen, mate, would you be interested in coming down for a jam with us? I'd love to, Dave. Give me a call when you've spoken to the other guys. Martin parked up outside the pub where Blackbird by rehearsed. It was on that depressing high street not far from the Chinese with the nasty dustbins that Martin used to have to empty. There was a betting shop on one side of the pub 
and a lady's hairdresser on the other. The railway bridge just down the road housed several arches in the side street. Dubious-looking lock-ups and shady car workshops. Martin unloaded his shiny fender amp and wheeled it through the public bar into the back room. The band were already set up. They looked up and waved as he came in. Dave introduced him. This is Martin. Martin, this is Rick on guitar, Jerry on drums and Marion on keyboards. Thanks for letting me play. I'll just have a listen first, if that's okay. Martin got himself a beer and sat down at one of the tables at the back of the room. The band went through some of their set. After a few songs, Dave asked Martin if he'd like to join in. They chose a Buddy Holly number and a couple of 12 bars to keep it simple. Martin and Rick swapped fours, playing solo on one song, a bit like lead guitar ping-pong. It made them both grin. They took a break to get refreshments. Dave looked really pleased. Love the two guitar thing, guys. Do you reckon we should give it a try? Rick nodded. Fine with me, Dave. Jerry and Marion both said yes too. It looked like Martin had a new band. Martin sat in the transit van, parked up in Old Compton Street in Soho. It wasn't a police van. It belonged to the band. They'd saved up six months' gig money to buy it. Rick's neighbour, Peter, had started to manage the band and act as a kind of agent. During the day, he drove for a minicab firm. He'd arranged for Martin to work as a driver, delivering parcels around Greater London. Martin had flunked his final exams and abandoned college. Now he zoomed around London by day and played with the band by night. His case would be heard at Crown Court. That took time. Life went on, but it still loomed like a dark cloud over his head. The radio on the dashboard crackled. Martin snapped out of his daydream. Dean Street for a parcel to Heathrow. Anybody free round Soho? 4-3. I'm just round the corner. Five minutes. Over. Martin, it's 78 Dean Street, Hardcastle, first floor, parcel for Heathrow Terminal 2, Singapore Airlines, must be there by 3. You better get a move on. I'll see what I can get for you for the way back. Over. 4-3. OK, we'll do. On my way. Out. Martin drove in a circle round the one-way system and pulled up on double yellow lines outside the office. He ran in and up the stairs, signed for the large parcel and ran back down again. He threw the parcel onto the passenger seat and roared off down the Chasbury Avenue and headed out west through Piccadilly, Knightsbridge, Kensington and Hammersmith and out onto the M4 to the airport. It was ten to three. He found the terminal drop-off parking spaces. He left the van there and ran into the departure lounge with the parcel. He put it on the Singapore Airlines counter, got a signature on his docket and ran back to the van. Luckily, it hadn't been towed away. He leapt in and roared off back east towards the motorway. he just got onto the M4 again when the controller reported in. 4-3, your lucky day. Got a parcel in kneeling for Walthamstow. Over. Brilliant, that takes me all the way home. Over. Drayton Court Hotel, just off the Broadway. Ask at reception. They'll sort you out. Over. Will do. On my way. About 20 minutes. Thanks a lot. Out. Saturday night was Southall. The pub was a rough dive. A regular gig for Blackbird Pie. Martin had settled into the line-up now. He got a fair share of the lead guitar and sang harmonies on quite a few numbers. He'd grown to hate a lot of the covers they did. It was crowds like this one who wanted to hear familiar tunes. They could growl along drunkenly, like a football chorus. Martin looked around the audience as he played another Eagles song. Mostly men drinking lager 
lots of denim and shirts with big collars, feather-cut hair long at the back, platform shoes. The girls looked like an ABBA contest, all menthols and baby sham, dressed in cheap, high street chain chic. They had a few hecklers that night. Dave gave them short shrift. Does your mum know you're out? I remember when I had my first beer. Martin noticed there was a commotion at the back of the room by the bar. Two guys were standing head to head. Looked like they were yelling insults at each other. He caught Dave's eye and nodded towards the trouble. The band were pretty loud, but you could still hear the shouting. Suddenly there were loud screams and the sound of breaking glass. One of the Neanderthals had picked the other one up and thrown him bodily over the bar. He took all the glasses with him. Friends joined in the fray. One of them picked up a chair and threw it against the optics behind the bar. The barman leapt over the counter and laid into the offender. The landlord stood at the end of the bar shouting down the phone. The fight began to spread and get out of control. The band stopped playing. Dave couldn't help laughing. He'd been singing Saturday Nights All Right for fighting. Rick and Martin put their guitars in their cases and stood in front of the amps. Dave and Jerry stood next to the PA speakers. Rick shouted to Marion to go into the back room behind the stage and shut the door. By the time the police arrived, there were a couple of casualties. One of the main culprits was out cold on the floor. The other was sitting in a chair, nursing a head wound and a few nasty cuts. Blackbird Pie had to abandon ship. They packed their gear away and waited until things had quietened down. Martin sat on his fender amp, smoking a cigarette. He was thankful nothing had got damaged and that none of them had been hit by flying glass or a beer bottle. London life. Sarah was pretty. Pretty young, too. She was Peter the band manager's daughter. After he started bringing her to rehearsals and gigs, she started to fancy Martin. He started to fancy her. She was five years his junior, but his hormones got the better of his common sense. Try as he would, he couldn't dismiss his yearnings. It began with harmless, friendly chats after the gig. Then Peter invited the band round for a meeting and they got talking again. Her dad let her stay over at Martin's for a weekend. That was it. They were together. Martin was in love. He grew steadily more and more fond of Sarah. She thought the world of Martin. She confided all kinds of secrets to him. He, in turn, decided he had to tell her about the bust. She promised to keep it a secret. She said she'd stand by him, whatever happened. 